Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Makeba Williams, who's going to be talking to us about disparities in the menopause transition. She's a board certified ob Vice Chair of Professional Development and Wellness in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, where she established the Medicine Menopause Program. So welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start with some basic questions first. You know, the very basic question, are there, and I, of course there are, racial and ethnic differences or disparities, if you will, in the menopause experience? Absolutely. We did a survey of more than 20 years of data and found that there is not a singular universal menopausal experience that African-American women in particular are coming to menopause and to this transition um, with a different set of contextual factors. So they are starting out with an increased level of disease burden, so higher risk metabolic syndrome, diabetes. We see differences in um, their rates of osteoporosis and a whole host of other diseases. And those uh, that differential disease burden actually impacts how they are experiencing some of those typical menopausal symptoms that we hear about. And so, is, it more, is it more than just coming with all these different comorbidities that contributes to health inequities? Is it in part that the um, menopause experience is not considered something that's important and the other comorbidities are? What influences this? So um, there is a sort of intersection of not only biological factors, but there is some complexity in that there is social cultural factors. The social determinants of health is also found to be a contributing factor to these differences that we see. So it's not just their race or their ethnicity, but a whole host of factors that influence that menopausal experience for African-American women. So if, you know, let's talk a bit a minute about historically and social culturally, the way um, African-American women may be thinking about menopause and whether or not this is a priority for them in terms of their other health symptoms. So what we have learned from the qualitative research that there are many different ways in which African-American women approach their symptoms, rationalize their symptoms. So there's a, a phenomena of normalization that these are just things, symptoms that one will endure as they go through the menopausal period. Um, there may be some silencing of these symptoms. It's just not something that's talked about within respective communities. And then there is a thought, well, I'm just going to tolerate this. So relative to the other things that are going on in my life, this is um, minimal and that there are other things. I think there was also uh, important to note that many African-American women view this time in life as one in which they are gaining greater sense of status and maturity in their lives. And so um, in that, there may be more tolerance that this is going to pass and I am enjoying this season of life where I have more respect in my communities. So if we look at what our basic understanding of menopause is, how is it different in different groups that's evolved over time? So we think about the hallmark symptoms of menopause. We see the vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes, the night sweats. We also note that the menstrual changes may be that harbinger of um, the menopausal transition. We have gleaned from the data that um, African-American women will experience these vasomotor symptoms for far longer. On average, African-American women are enduring vasomotor symptoms for 10 years compared to white women who experience them for 6.5 years. So we're, we see a longer duration of symptoms, the frequency of symptoms, and the severity also differs when we compare to white women. And we see that 80% of African-American women are experiencing these symptoms. So it's a higher uh, burden of vasomotor symptoms. When we look at the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, 
overall, we haven't done a really great job of capturing that experience for menopausal women. African-American women reported fewer vaginal symptoms overall, but when they did report those symptoms related to the genitourinary syndrome, it was the vaginal dryness that was more um, complained about for those. Um, we did notice that there were some differences in sleep. So African-American women had poor overall poor quality of sleep when we look at it objectively, though subjectively they reported um, fewer sleep disruptive episodes. Um, the data regarding depression and mood was a bit inconclusive. So we've got a lot more to learn um, to tease out what those differences and disparities are. Because in general, African-American women have been underrepresented in our menopausal um, body of research. And I think that's really so critical because we talk about gender gap in you know, in general between men and women. But if we look within the population of women, not everybody is homogenous. And if, if this group is excluded from the data that we have, we end up taking data that may be applicable only to white women and generalize it into other racial groups where simply that data doesn't hold. Absolutely. So I think about menopausal women in general. They're an underserved, undertreated population. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. And so we, when we look at how our specialty um, sort of values, uh, tacitly values, there's a lot of value placed on reproductive age women and um, menopausal women, I believe, don't get their full uh, sort of um, billing or um, evaluation. So there's that underserved population there. And then when we segment by race and ethnicity, we get even more under service to this critical area of women's health. And therefore, we do apply these norms that have been gleaned from literature focused most, um, mostly on white women to these different segments of populations of women of color. And again, there isn't a universal menopausal experience. Yes, women will, all women or people born with ovaries will experience a decline in ovarian function, a decline in estrogen production, but the way in which individuals of color or groups of color experience menopause is different because of that cultural, social uh, interplay that overlies that biological change. And that's got to also interfere in terms of access to care or going forward with a complaint that, that may be marginalized and not looked at as being validated or important to a group, which further keeps you from seeking the care that you should have. I would think it's even worse with symptoms like a GSM. Absolutely. You know, we, we do know that there are the social determinants of health. Like, so when we look at um, some of those influencing factors, educational attainment was found to be lower um, for African-American women, more unemployment. And so when you um, have limited opportunity to high quality healthcare, higher quality education, that will impact overall your health and well-being and helps uh, influence how you prioritize what is important. So yes, you have vaginal dryness. Yes, you have vaginal symptoms. However, there may be more pressing factors in your life because of the social constructs and social context in which you are living and experiencing or inexperiencing health. So that leads me to talk about treatments and whether or not the opportunity, one, to receive treatment or accept treatment is, and who is offering it and who is receiving it. That's one aspect of it. But then in terms of the differences that may be offered between populations that do and do not experience disparities. So if we sort of take access to care off the table, recognizing that there already is an existing disparity, once you do enter the system, how does treatment differ for these two groups or does it? Well, we did find that African-American women were half as likely to be treated with hormonal therapy. Why is that? We don't exactly know. Um, is it because African-American women are not coming forward with symptoms 
or that providers are not recognizing asking about those symptoms and therefore treatment isn't offered? Or is it that treatment is being offered, hormone therapy is being offered, and for various reasons, African-American women are less accepting of those treatments. So there's more research to be done. There's a recent study done in a population of veterans. And what we gleaned from that is that there were disparities. So when you take access to care off the table, there were still disparities in treatment. And so research going forward needs to better understand what are those driving factors? Is it a lack of recommendation of treatment or are there particular concerns that African-American and other women of color had with the various treatment options, whether they are hormonal or non-hormonal? McKibbin, before I let you go, the notion of barriers to care from a patient's perspective and a healthcare professional's perspective, often when we look at the same issue, for example, in immunization, if we look at immunization, often patients won't, won't go for immunization because the uh, healthcare practitioner didn't recommend it. And the healthcare practitioner will often say, well, I didn't recommend it because I see cost as a barrier to care. But nobody's having the conversation about putting out, here are what is offered, and then let's talk about what you can and cannot accept. So is that true for menopause as well, that there's that the healthcare practitioners perceived what may be a barrier and why they don't bring it up may be completely different than a patient's perception of what the barrier to care or access to treatment might be. I think that's absolutely correct. And so where and how do you um, get over that barrier is bringing equity to how you approach patient care and looking at a framework of providing culturally responsive care and making sure that we are offering all patients um, equity to the knowledge base, to the treatment that we have, and not making assumptions, letting implicit right. bias enter into our respective exam rooms and to um, approach patients with openness that they um, are experiencing menopausal symptoms, that they are open to treatment. And it really is our job as healthcare providers to provide that education and level set that there are opportunities to help our patients better navigate the menopausal transition and menopause, irrespective of what we think they may um, be tolerant of or accepting of. And I think that's just an important note to end on, irrespective of, we, of what we might think, maybe biasing healthcare providers in a way that we're not even aware of. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.